Pizza! That's it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Hi, I'm Larry Tatum, and welcome to my DVD on increasing your power curves through the use of certain very important Kempo principles. Now, I'm going to start with one, and I'm going to start with it in the foot maneuvers because we're going to work from the ground up. And I'm highlighting in this DVD principles that should remain a constant in the continuum of Kempo. And what I mean by the continuum, the things that continue to make Kempo what it is, to keep it alive, certain things have to remain constant. And if they are constant, then you have this relationship of principles and concepts to each other that are constant. So the Kempo continuum is made up of principles, concepts that are interrelated, and like I said again, are constant. Starting with the first one, one that I have used from the first time that I saw Kempo and I understood early on when I was a kid, was the power had to erupt from the soles of the feet up to the body, to the top of the head, out to the fingertips. And too often, people leave out the proper stances and footworks, not in their relationship as the parameters in which they are set up, toe to heel, knee to heel, and this type of thing, but how to step into a stance, and at the moment of doing so, you create power throughout the entire body by sending energy from the feet up to your head. All right, now, with the help of Robert, Robert starts in a left neutral bow. All right, now, we're going to take a right punch, and as Robert punches, I'm going to drop back, and as I drop back, settling is fine. We know that. We settle in our blocks, in our stances. But most people, when they do that, they step, bend their knees, and feel that that's plenty for the power or to maximize their power, okay? Now, what I'm going to do is show you how to integrate a principle of shifting the energy from the soles of your feet all the way up to this block. And the way that occurs as I step back and I plant, I also push myself forward again back into my front leg. Now, that doesn't mean I'm shifting my balance per se. It's still basically 50-50, but it, I'm rooting myself differently. And what happens is I shift here and I shift down and forward for a brief moment. So look what happens to the block. In the first part of the step, as I move, punch a little faster, Robert. Okay. Yes. The block is connected to the first step. As the shift occurs from, from this is when the chop occurs on the, on the next move. So you get this reverberation to do it again. So we have one, yes. two. And so what's happening is I'm maximizing my power from this back to front and then to center again. Watch it by myself. As I move, it's back and then forward. Okay, now not only is this important just for this particular type of, te type of technique, but if Robert was grabbing me, and we'll watch out for my microphone here, on long kimono, again, most people pin. As they pin, they step, position themselves, and then execute the break from the power of the arm rather than from the power of the legs supporting the arm. So what we're going to do on this, as I step back here, I drop my foot and I move my energy back, yes! back forward to this foot. And again, if I come around, the same thing occurs here as I'm shifting this energy back and forth to maximize each and every move that I make. Okay, let's take a technique like triggered salute. Now, triggered salute teaches a lot, okay? some of which I'm sure that you already know, that within a circle, Robert, let me borrow him again. Within a circle, and I'm going to turn him on this side so you can see here from here. As Robert pushes, he steps in and push. What I do is I match that angle. So if you look at our arms, we're basically matched, OK? Angle alignment is the same. Mine is going to be a positive match, and his is going to become a negative. But nonetheless, we are mirrored at this point. Now, it calls, calls for a heel palm, rake down the arm, and then back with an elbow to the solar plexus for the first part of the technique. Now, within a circle, within this di it's a diagonal circle, three points of contact within a circle. So this circle is diagonal, 
it's not a vertical and then it shifts over to a diagonal. It's all on a diagonal plane to this target here. Okay, that's fine. But we have one, two, three, four moves counting the check, five counting the step. And we want to, we can break this up and teach it this way. We go one, break down two, an elbow. Or we can use the same principle I did with my stance as he pushes yes. from this yes. to the elbow becomes almost one move. And the way that I'm achieving that is that as I step and I go to hit Robert, what I do is I shove my weight forward now and then back and then forward and back again. It's that reverberation of that stance. Now, what most people do is they get in and they try to go as fast as they can through this technique, but this is rooted at, at a 50-50 weight distribution. There is no change in energy, okay? By myself, excuse me, one second, Robert, as I move, you can see me move in, but I push back to get this fluctuation going, okay? In Kempel, it used to be taught back in the, what I call the old days, back in the 60s, and it was taught primarily to get you used to establishing a strong base at all points of contact, whether you're sparring, self-defense techniques, whatever, even within the katas or the forms that you do, and even the sets. So what I'm doing here is Robert moves in, I move my step, and I'm not off balance, but I'm just a little bit shifted to this. By the time this hits, my leg is already back and by the time the elbow comes around, I've already checked this point here. I'm back to my back, back leg at this point and then back into the elbow, elbow. So it gives you an idea how to do it there. Thank you, Robert. Now, if you watch me, the first step in the pin are like this. And the second part of the step, you can see my weight shift. And then back and shift again and back. It's minor. And it, it translates from the soles of the feet, rather than going, and this is what most people try to do. It's a little sophisticated, but you need to practice it. If you can do it stepping back to forward to brace, that means you can go forward to back to brace and back to forward with the help of Jay. And what I'm doing is I'm picking techniques and I'm altering a little, little bit so that I can illustrate the footwork more. Again, on this particular technique, Jay throws a left punch, much like we would do shielding hammer, okay? Now, once I brace myself and it's locked in, it's harder for me to get started again because I've actually stopped. I've actually stopped my energy. People ask me all the time about key. Well, key is not something that's an intangible thing, but it's, you can actually lock into it if you understand that you don't want to stop it, okay? And there are certain ways, as we'll go on in this DVD, I'll show you how they can keep the key flowing. As Jay punches, what I do is I back off and in again so that if I make my hit here, I can drop straight down, but then as I move from the next point, pop! That speed and timing comes from the footwork rocking back to forward and back Again, you, most people won't see it when it happens. You can see it as I block. And you can see it here. You can see the torque, and the torque rotates back and so forth, but and so forth. Thank you, Jay. Okay, so again, it goes back to that one, two, three. All right? Now, when you practice this, you don't want to overdo it. It's extremely subtle. Key moves subtly, okay? Key moves through a thought pattern. All right, now, when I did the other technique with Robert, Triggered Salute, I established the thought pattern and allowed my footwork to carry it out. Robert, let me borrow you again. That means, as Robert pushed, I wanted to get away from one, two, three counts. 
I wanted to turn that mostly into one, maybe one and a half count. So what I had to do was mentally project when I saw the push coming, the pattern that I wanted to fulfill what I'm seeing in my mind, the pattern. Robert pushes, and I fulfill that pattern by the use of the feet. And now another method to create power in your techniques is to take a technique like reversing mace. All right. When most people do it, and it's not wrong, by the way, okay, because what I'm doing in this DVD is to get you to maximize your power through certain principles. What I'm doing here, as I step off for a left punch, Jay, if it's a straight left that we're dealing with, we step off, and most people step up the circle into a neutral bowl. And then they depend upon marriage of gravity, okay, counter body torque, which is called direct opposites, to create power. You can shuffle with it. That's a third way of doing it, okay? Or you can break through and get a lot of excessive body torque. Now, they're all correct in their usage, and they all have a place. Or I can step off, punch at me right up here. Yes, I can step off into a forward and then use my back heel to what? To move me into position for the power. Pop at this point from this to this. Now what's happening is I'm making a circle out of my footwork and there's that rocking back and forth to set up a sturdy base Okay, but to keep your energy in flux. So as, as he moves in, I'm at my forward bow at this point, and then for a brief second, I'm only there as part of a turn to what? Get the back knuckle in, and so forth. Okay? Thank you, Jay. Okay, now, if we take a technique, uh, again, we're going to use a left punch followed by a right punch with ro help of Robert. On the left punch here, my rock back, but then as the right punch comes, I rock somewhat forward to make contact. Now, I'm going to make contact with Robert here on the bicep, okay? Now, what am I also going to do is to increase your power curve. I want to introduce the proper use of the opposite hand. So when I teach Kempel, I teach Kempel in terms of do you know what all parts of your bodies are doing? And the only way that you're going to know that in what we term as the continuum of Kempel, where all parts of the body are in focus and related to each other and are constant, is if you, if you can only do that and have that knowledge if you assign certain jobs to every part of your body. So that when I move, if I block his punch, do I know what my left hand is doing? Do I know what my stance is doing? Am I just settled? Or do I increase a little more shift of weight here to anticipate to move that energy forward to this. And if I did, did I back this action up with the use of this hand? Okay? Did I give it a function other than just as a guardian check? Okay? So knowing that each part of your body has a function, and that starts that you assign what your feet are going to do, where they're going to be. I just don't assume stepping back is enough. I never did. So when Robert punches, and I got here, you can just see the little bit of shift. Shoot. Yes. At this point. Okay, and then that allows me to shift my weight from this up again, and so forth. And if I want to hit to the groin, then there's at that momentary shift and then at the last moment of contact, everything, what, comes together, as they should. Because I know what this foot is doing, and I know what this foot is doing. I know what my hands and my head and my back are doing at the same time. Thank you, Robert. You see, I think of myself in terms of one big muscle, OK? And that means that as I move, and I want you to experience this, is the whole body moves as one big muscle, not just the arms by themselves and then a leg. That could be illustrated like this. Jay, let me borrow you. Left punch. Okay, now, let's say that, move it over a little bit, that this is my base. One, 
two, three, and four. You see many people come around here just a little bit, Jay, right about here. Bring your left punch around. Is that they go one, they may shuffle two, three, and four. Okay? But they're giving energy signals to only to the the weapons. When you watch me do this, there's the rock. This hits. And then from this, this movement, the whole body acts as a muscle. From this to this. And even this acts, the whole body is engaged on this move. Okay? Thank you, Jay. Let's take this a step further. And what I'm going to do is, is my assistants today are going to help, and we're going to have everybody do that, uh, rocking back and forth. Okay? We call it the Kempel Rock. Other people have the other names for it. But I'm with the help of my oldest daughter, Brittany Tatum, she's going to do parting wings on me. And I want to show you something. Come on up, Britt. I'm going to turn this way so that you guys can see what she's doing. Now, as Britt gets pushed, she's going to part my arms and just do a normal step into a neutral. Okay, now, which is fine, but I want you to send power to your arms. Just do that normal step again. Go. It's a little stronger, okay? Now, use the rock step as you go back, come forward. You can, I can feel it, and I think you can see it, okay? Do it again a little harder and faster. Exactly. See how it engaged her? It engaged her into which the next strike will be the chop to the floating rib or the top rib, either one, okay? You guys see how that suddenly engaged her? Now, do it without that engagement. You see how it stops her, and it allows me to continue, okay? Because I haven't stopped my forward momentum. It's been separated, but my chest and the rest of my body can still move on her depth line. So what she needs to do to engage herself to be at least matched to my energy or, not, or to go past my point of power that I'm producing is to have that rock step. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is she's going to do it again, but this time she's going to allow that second part of that rock step to launch her chop into me. <laughs> Very nice. Now, what happened is it's offsetting to the attacker because what I felt energy-wise, what I actually saw was her move back, but I saw her mass suddenly move into me to match my forward momentum. And you can probably see it yourself. Let's do it again. You go ahead and hit me. I'll live, okay? Yes, sir. So you've got to teach yourself, envision what you're going to see in your mind, and let that rock step push it forward. Ready? That's what I want. That's how you get it there fast, because the chop was in sync with the second part of the rock. Whether she used a forward or stayed in a neutral or just twisted at the hips, it's irreverent at this point, because... It did the work with the body mass behind it. Okay? Beautiful. Now, when the chop occurs, where does their energy shift? Well, it should shift down and back to forward. Okay? It's that subtle. Down and back to forward. So we're here. Go. Exactly. Okay? Do it again. Hit me in the chest. Don't worry about it. Go. Good. Do it again. Hit me harder. Now, once you hit me right here, mm -hmm. when you're ready to go, you're going to just shift slightly back, and slightly forward, and drop. Exactly. Okay, now do it without doing that. Just pivot. That's what you're dealing with if you don't bring this along. Okay? So a lot of, thank you, Brett. A lot of you guys are asking at home, how do I get power in my moves? And some days you go to your school or wherever you train, and you had a great night, and you felt that power surge, and you thought, well, I'm getting better. And you come back the next day or a week later, and you don't have it again. Well, you may have tripped into this accidentally, okay? But now I'm showing you how to go into this, stay in it, to maximize your power. Okay, now a way to practice this, and I'm going to use them to help me. And the reason I have different belt levels is in different body sizes and gender is because everybody has their own little signature to this rock step, okay? Now, the way I practice it is I drop back, 
bring my hands right hand, right hand down, left hand up, I make contact with my foot, and then I shift into my front foot again. And you can see that little shift of weight. But my hands help counterbalance me into doing this. Okay? Like I was if I was going to do a push down block here and a push down block behind me. It helps to center me with the hands. The hands are help centering because the body is doing a little bit of a rocking motion. So to keep myself centered is I need my hands to help. Now this is just for the exercise of developing it. Okay, you guys ready? One, two. Exactly. So you, now over exaggerate it just a little bit. Okay? So they can see it. Okay, ready? One, two. That is it right there. Good. And the more energy you focused here and on the back of your hands, the stronger the stance is going to be. All right, let's try it again. Ready? One, two. Exactly. Okay, now let's do it fast. Keep your eyes looking straight ahead. One, two. Exactly. Now do it again without that principle. Just step back and drop your weight. It's dead. That's dead energy, you guys. That's what you want to get away from. Okay, now go back and do it correctly. Once you go. Exactly. All right. Now, thank you, guys. Now, we used to practice this. Uh, Brittany, let me borrow you again. Sonny, I'm sorry. Sonny, let me borrow you. We used to practice this by, Sonny, put, me, uh, put your uh, neutral bone. Get down low. It's not only through parting wings, but actually by just shoving somebody so it shoves the weight back to the rear leg. And then she has to quickly move it, shift it forward. And it doesn't shift from here. Most people, when they get pushed, push with your shoulder. They try to push back with what they're feeling from here. When what you want to do is to push back from your soles of your feet. OK, ready? I'm going to do it once. Go. More with the feet. Ready? Exactly. Now make it fast. Exactly. Do it again. Go. And try to stay focused on this. Go. That was it. That was the best one you did. OK, now do it without, without the foot. OK? All right. So this gives, thank you, Sonny. This gives you an idea of how to practice this. Now, I, when I'm working out in my forums or if I'm sparring, that's two different things. Or if I'm doing a self-defense technique. If I'm doing a kata, okay, what I do is I'll come in and settle and drop and not necessarily do this when I'm doing the kata because that's a combative principle that we add. All right. Now, even if I'm sparring, um, let me borrow uh, Robert, let me borrow a second. In a sparring technique, if I decide, get down a little, Robert, that Robert and I are fighting, okay? And I decide that my motion is going to be here, up to, up to here. And I'm going to glance off his lead arm, OK, from here to the face. And what I do is I'll shift, I'll shift forward with my leg. And at the last moment, I'll shift back yes. with it, to brace myself into the final part of the punch. You can see the weight shift forward. And as I launch the punch, OK, now it may look a little time consuming because I really slowed it down. But when I'm doing it, what I'm doing now, yes. it's all in one motion. Yes. And it's subtle. Now, did you know that posture plays a very important part in your ability to maximize your power? OK, now posture just doesn't refer to just keeping your back straight. But posture, when we speak of it in terms of Kempo, is important in that it maximizes the effort that you are employing in a certain technique. Now, for example, like uh, Jay, let me borrow you for a second. All right. And with the help of Jay, if I do Thundering Hammer, when people make the block, all right, and I come across the block, I make sure that my angle of deflection is supported by what? My stance, all right? So when Jay punches at me, right, what I do is I brace that rocking footwork into it. Now, as I move to hit Jay, it's the torque of my body that is giving centrifugal force to this arm. I mean, it's, it goes to the groin or the solar plexus. 
I'm going to use the solar plexus on this particular technique. Now, as I move, what I need is to be able to shuffle in deep enough so that his knee gets attacked by mine, or his shin, okay? Now, what happens is most guys will do this. They'll bury themselves behind this, which is fine, okay? So this is a lunging method using a lot of backup mass. More backup mass as opposed to dropping your weight. It's fine, and it's another method of doing this technique. Or you can brace into the block, and as we move, I drop my height and increase more torque as I hit and as I shuffle. So you can see my body literally screw into the ground. The body torques, the body shuffles forward as I make my hit, okay? Now, my back is very straight at this point, so I'm not using forward momentum to create the power as much as I'm using marriage of gravity and torque. So you have your choice in this. Now, if I use too much of this, I have to regain that depth that I took to get back to this hammer. If I keep my back straight and I hook this hand over, my hammer is right there. It's still in line to the target from this as I move to my next shot. And again, my center line now is in line to his neck because of my posture. So that as I track from here, right, as I move, pop, there's my next shot right there. Okay, now, when I left off with Jay, Jay and everybody, you know, thundering hammers, I was talking about body posture and how it affects your torque and also how it affects your depth, your depth of action, okay, that you don't want to over dive past the target, okay? There is a moment of fluctuation to where if you stop the body and it's tracked, it'll allow the extremities to suddenly speed up as they make contact, okay, as they go to their respective targets. So that's another principle that I want you guys to learn. We did it here. What I did was I stopped my body here and what? let this thing go. As I turned here, I stopped it and let it go at this direction. As I turned back again, I stop my body here and let it travel again. Okay, now, if I get Jade down on his knee and I step off and I decide to come back in with a back knuckle, what it, this is called a load up move and power moves in many cases are, they take time to load up. I've injured my opponent so I can load up and then shuffle in with a back knuckle, which matches the angle of the head. Now, if you watch my body as I step off, I shift my weight to my heel, load up, all right, and then I have this what? This, this rock, rock step at that point. That's what I'm doing. And that rock step carries a lot of power because it stops me vertically at the right point, it stops me, and then the shifting of my weight allows that to move forward, and so forth. Pop. That's how that works. Thank you, Jay. All right, so if you watch this again, I rock back, and that sets me off in the direction I want to go. But I don't plant my foot flat, because if I do, it stopped my action. So what I do is I rock back, step back again, and then as I load up, I move back and forth to create this, what we call momentous expansion. Time in which you can load up, a moment of time in your fight where you can deal a final blow. In the case of Thundering Hammers, that's what this particular technique is about. All right, now, Jay, let me borrow you again. When Jay goes down, and I move off, and I load up. You notice that when I load up, my feet start to load up and down. And I reverse my circles. This is reversing mace without a punch. It's just in the air. 
from this to the and back. It's the same principle as the beginning of Thundering Hammer. Centripetal force. As I stop my body, this launches forward. Okay. Thank you, Jay. Let's take a technique thrusting salute. We're going to take it out of its ideal teaching arrangement and for our purposes we're going to alter it just a little bit so we get get back to using that footwork again to help. Generally on thrusting salute, um, Jay let me borrow it for a second. If Jay puts his right leg back and he comes in with a kick, we step off into a neutral bow and do a left downward block. We chamber the right hand and at orange belt level that's pretty much what we're going to do. Okay. All right, now, what would happen, bring the kick up, if my hand was up, and as my hand went down, instead of a neutral kick a little faster, I went to a forward bowl, kick at me, from this to this. All right, the forward bowl automatically sets up my leg at this point, okay? Rather than going to a neutral, and I'm going to use this hand while I'm talking, being fixed in a neutral position so that you have to turn again. What we're going to do is be in the forward so I can bounce back in to my target. Thank you, Jay. Sir. Brittany, you want to do that with me? So I'm going to kick at Brittany. And we'll turn at this angle this way. And we'll do it a double factor block. I'm going to have this hand up. And this is so block diagonally. And then she'll sweep it clean with that hand. Okay? All right, but she's going to go to a forward bow. There she already was back in with the kick. That's what the forward bow does for you. It launches you back in. All right. Now this time go to a neutral and do that. Hand up. You see how it, it makes you stop. The neutral positions you to stop. Now that's fine at orange belt level because you're reaffirming a particular stance, neutral bow but you're doing a neutral bow on an angle. In this case, it would be approximately 4 o'clock. So that's what you're teaching. But as a student gets up to certain levels, then you take these shortcuts. We cut circles in Kempel in half with the other hand or the other leg. Okay, There's a number of ways to cut circles in halves. So when she goes to a forward bow, she's actually cutting the circle back there in half. Do your step. Move it over a little bit so the camera can pick it up. Lean a little bit into your forward. This is actually cutting it in half where this is not. So by cutting it in half, she can launch right through the circle. Okay? And she's going to pretend like she stepped on a tack. All right, here we go again. Hand is up. For practice. Go. Now, to increase the power of the kick, I'm going to have her check this arm down. All right, now watch how, remember I showed you earlier to increase your power that what is your other hand doing? Have you given an assignment? When I was working with Robert and Jay, I did my outward block, but I brought my left hand into play at the right moment. So what she's going to do, we'll do just take it up to where we did before, but as she moves in, she needs a catalyst to give her more power, not only from the stance, but now from the upper part of the body. And that would be what? This to this. Okay? All right, let's do that now. Ready? Go. But I want to feel this hand here. Yes, sir. As you move in on the kick. Now watch again. That's it. Yeah. Okay? Now, what she did was maximize her body's potential to create proper timing, which in turn created proper power maximize your power. Now, we'll do that again, but don't use the left hand as you come in. You see how it's suddenly dead? And this wants to stop unless you are going to push it through your mind. Okay, we'll do this again. Okay. All right, now this time, add the hand in. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Britt. All right, so we need the proper stance, right? The stance, we're using a double factor block. But as I begin my kick, this hand comes out and becomes part of everything that's going on. 
Now, that's a lot to think about for an orange belt, so that's why it's not taught at that point. If you're at a lower level than where this is taught, at least now you can understand where you're going to go with some of this information. Okay, now, with the help of Sunny, there she goes. All right, we're going to do flashy maze. And I'm going to choose flashy maze because what it does, give me a right punch, Sonny, is that as I block with this hand and we break, and I know you guys know this technique, and up, is that a lot of times people have trouble developing speed with the step through, okay? As you hammer across the side of the head or the eye because the step actually slows down the process of the strike, because the strike is much faster than the step. That's why in Dance of Death, we don't step and strike, or Sleeper, we don't step and chop, because the step actually slows the chop down. Okay, it's faster to execute your weapon with a stance change. Now, it doesn't mean that sometimes you don't want to step with your chop. So in a case like this, this somewhat breaks a rule of Kempo, a stepping and striking at the same time, where the step and the strike are on the si same side of the body. But we can break that rule of Kempo by making the break here. And to make myself move faster at this point is to engage the bottom hand from this <coughs> to this. It helps speed up everything that we do by engaging this hand because it pulls and it pulls and it leads the step just enough so I can get around and make my hit and so forth and up okay all right good so I want you to do it on me okay come on over here now what Sonny's going to do is she's going to step in move in a little bit step in and break the arm both hands flash okay do it again do it a little stronger Break down. Go. Okay, now, I want you to step through. Don't engage this. Just step through and hammer. As fast as you can, Sonny. As fast as you can. Just that move. Let's do it again. Do the break. Go. It's not bad. All right, now, this time, do the break. Engage both hands. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, she develops more centrifugal force by engaging that bottom hand. And what happens is, give me a right punch, Sonny, is that as I move up, this is a reversing mace type of motion. That's what's happening. Rather than stopping and then, then trying to jump your check or go underneath it and so forth or around it in some fashion, it's already on its way as it pulls you around into position and so forth. Do it again on me, Sonny. Okay, come on up. Go. Yeah, exactly. Nice and fast, isn't it? OK, now do it again. Now that we have engaged the bottom hand to create more centrifugal force, as you step back, Sonny, or you step in or back? I'm Forward. As you step in, I want you to rock back on that first block and then go from there. Ready? Go. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Thank you, Sonny. Very nice. That's how it's done. You've got to put assignments to different parts of your body to get to maximize your power. And this increases your power curves in Kempel. These are some of the concepts, the principles that I work with daily as I teach. And I wanted to pass these on to you. Now that we've been uh, through this so far, what I'd like to do is have some questions and answer time with um, my fellow assistants. And this, uh, you know, I know th those of you at home would like to ask questions, so I'm going to have them ask me questions. And this is off the cuff. I don't know what they're going to ask me. And this will give some more insight into what they want to know about uh, uh, techniques and how they work for themselves. And hopefully, these will be some of the questions that you'll want to ask at home. Uh, Jay, you got a question? Yes. Is there a particular technique or uh, way you recommend on perfecting the walking pattern? I, I would say that parting wings, like I did with Brittany earlier, is a great way to establish that ability. Um, also, um, reversing mace by stepping into a forward bow and then pivoting into a neutral on a strike is another way to develop it. Um, parting wings, uh, snapping twig, lone kimono, because on the break of lone kimono, 
you want to have your weight shifted back to that front foot and back again for a split second. So those, those would be some helpful techniques, okay? Um, you can actually do them in a kata. It makes a kata look stilted, but uh, if you're doing it to develop that exercise, it'd be good to do it with short form one. You go back and forward, back and forward, just to get the muscle groups in your leg accustomed to that, that type of fluctuation. Yeah. Thank you. Brittany. So when you're uh, mapping your path, that makes your moves faster. Exactly. Well, eventually, the, does the body eventually develop enough muscle memory so that you don't have to remap that path every time, or does it change according to opponent size and environment? And the ability to map is not so much muscle memory as it is the mind's ability to accept a course of action. Mm -hmm. Okay? And when you're practicing in the early stages of your Kempo, a course of action is set up by what you see, what you read in your opponent, um, what you're told to do, what you're learning from my DVDs or from your teacher, whatever. Uh, a course of action has to come from the subconscious. When you ask your mind to establish a certain criteria that you want to do at that moment, it has to obey what you've told it to do, all right? So that takes, uh, it takes a while to develop. It, you don't have to wait years to develop that because we're talking about it now. And this is what I teach my own students, that when you walk out that door and you sense trouble, then map something out, a course of action. And now that course of action doesn't have to be written in stone in your brain, but nonetheless, there has to be a course set up so that you have something to go by. You need some tracks. How does uh, rocking relate with uh, the stance shift? Going from neutral bow to four bow is is there something separate or is it is it is a, a minor version of that. If you go from a neutral bow to a forward, you're shifting your weight sixty percent up there, okay? But you're not shifting weight back, okay? So when you do this little rock rock step where you shift forward and back. It can be in a forward bow, it can be in a neutral, it could even be in a cat, okay? You said that that rock step isn't something you put in the forms usually because Correct. that's a combative thing. You put yeah. in extra or it can leave them looking stilted was right. what you just right. said. But lately when I've been working on long six mm -hmm. in say right at the beginning in the glancing lance section or later on with the the technique against the kick with the leg break, uh -huh. that rocking does seem to be there. It is there. It is there. And it, it, it does show up. It's just that you don't want to do it throughout the entire form unless you are doing it just to establish that type of form. Yeah, absolutely. Now, for instance, in the beginning of form six, that as I step back and I execute this move here, okay, which is the basis of the whole form, all right? Now, as I come in with my kick, as I make the kick, right, there's a certain amount of forward and drop here to get you off to the next. Yeah, exactly what e I was saying. Exactly, okay. So there is a little bit of it throughout, but this very dynamic rock, rocking back and forth uh, shouldn't be done at every point, but it can be done at the beginning of a technique, in the middle, or at the end, or all three, okay? Yeah, if, uh, if you look at some of my DVDs, you'll see me do it, okay? At this point in my training, it, you know, for many years now, it hasn't been um, a conscious effort. It's just part of what we call the continuum of Kempo, right? All related concepts and principles are constant. The things I do for years, I have been doing for years, were constants to me, and I may or may not have been teaching them, but now, at this stage of my life, I'm starting to teach certain things that, like I said before, that are just constant with what I do. Um, when people do moves, no matter how good they are in their physical ability, it's not magic. There are certain things going on that maybe somebody else isn't doing. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to relate in this DVD. I'm Larry Tatum, and I hope you enjoy this DVD. It's fun for me to do this, and like I said, that as I am, the years that I'm teaching Kempo now, and I've been doing this for almost 44 years, it's a pleasure for me to teach the things that, like I've been doing, that have been constants for me, 
But now I'm going to teach some of those things that I think may help you in your journey in Kempo. I look forward to seeing you on future DVDs. I'm Larry Tatum.